I wasn't quite sure what an appropriate uh, destination was after Madeira after some soul searching but you know there's a feeling I get when I look to the west and my spirit is crying for leaving so let's go Well, good morning, uh, Phantom Shipmates. Uh, I left uh, Madeira a little more than 24 hours ago, flying along nicely now. I'll, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of a brief of uh, what I'm trying to do on this passage. I want to go to North America uh, and pass next to Bermuda. Uh, so it's, it's a bit of an unusual um, path that I've chosen. But a lot of people have done it before. You just have to be careful about the weather because uh, it's not the, the risk of storms, it's the risk of being becalmed by the Azores Bermuda High. So I need to stay below that. So let me show you what I'm trying to do here. You see, I'm a long ways away. Uh, that's where I started, and that's where I want to go to. Bermuda. I'm not sure I'll stop there, but uh, that's that's what's intended. Uh, a couple of the weather models say go way, way, way south. Others are saying stay further north and just thread between the the blue blue areas, which is what I intend to do. So I've still got a long ways to go, and uh, you know, miles to go is still miles away <laughs> because it's so far. So I'll just play it day by day with the basic strategy being aim at the southern tip of Florida and then turn north when the winds allow. I'm underway now from uh, La Ciara and Madeira. It took me forever to get out of the lee of that island where there was no wind. It was like four or five, four or five, six knots of wind. So you hate to start a long passage motoring for four hours. And that's exactly what I did. But I had to get out of the lee of the island, and as soon as I cleared the lee of the island, now I'm, you can see I'm looking at 21 knots, and I'm doing about 7 knots. So, 21 knots, uh, I put one reef in the main. Uh, I put the full Jenny out. Uh, let's put some miles on. Me, up on my pony, on my boat. I can't think. I went down to get lunch while I was there. <laughs> Things of the spinnaker can get out of hand really quickly. I'll sort it out. Release the sheet. Well, I found out why the uh, spinnaker was wrapped around the uh, forestay. Let's see here. This for the halyard guide pulled out off of the mast, and that freed the halyard up. Amos. Day two and I've lost my spinnaker. Uh, it's a half hour later and I'm back sailing again. I got the full Jenny out and a full mainsail out. And we're doing six and a half to seven and a half knots. So it's not a disaster but uh, I'm expecting low, much lower winds in a, a couple of days. And it's nice to have that big spinnaker on low wind days. 
You know, I have all the tools. To, I could fix that. I I have drills. I have a tap set. Uh, I even have a big uh, rivet gun and rivets with me. So I could go up the mast. Uh, I brought all those tools to do that kind of stuff in a marina. But I don't think it's really safe or worthwhile. Maybe if I have a dead, glassy, calm day, maybe I'll consider that. But uh, the sun is just coming up over there. Looks like a nice day. I just have to tell you that uh, I was uh, really kind of gutted yesterday when I lost the utilization of my... Um, uh, spinnaker or my asymmetric spinnaker because it's a huge asymmetric spinnaker and I was counting on this passage which is like 2,500 miles long I was counting on doing it at uh, speeds of uh, 7 to 12 knots uh, even though the boat is grossly overloaded uh, with fuel and water and food and all of that I thought that spinnaker was going to do a great job of pulling me along uh, at uh, really reasonable speeds and uh, now I've lost the spinnaker. Uh, so, uh, that's a big disappointment, but I'll have to adapt to that. Uh, now it's going to be more of the traditional classic uh, trade wind uh, passage uh, of four to six knots. Uh, uh, and I'll try, uh, I'll try to put the, the, uh, the two head cells on wing on wing. That's where you have the, the Genoa on one side and the uh, Stasol uh, uh, crank dead solid on the other side. <clears throat> but that really works best when you have a pole, and I don't have a pole aboard. That was one of the projects that fell by the wayside when, uh, uh, with COVID and illness and all the rest of that. So, so it's a new day. Time to uh, turn the page on uh, some bad news there. But... Uh, uh, we're not broken, just bent. Okay, so here's a chafe problem. You can see that, that uh, this is the outhaul to the foot of the mainsail. And the foot of the mainsail, where this piece of metal is right here, that's supposed to be connected there, right there. But you can see that piece of metal broke. And that allowed the foot of the mainsail to float out probably 12 or 15 uh, centimeters and uh, that caused the outhaul to be pulling at an angle rather than straight down rather than straight down the reef it was pulling at an angle and that wore through or certainly wore through the cover down to the Dyneema so I tied this line here on I'll try to even make it tighter to hold the foot of the sail as close as possible to the center line so that the the line will come like this. Now I've got plenty of line on this, so I'm just gonna pull this forward and retie the knot, uh, and that should uh, get us to the next port anyway. Okay, you see I've retied the, uh, the bowline, and hopefully now it'll ride a little straighter in the sheave rather than at an angle because I've uh, tightened up the line there as well. So I'll just cut this off now and watch it every single day. Well, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I am uh, just about 500 miles into uh, this 2,500 mile passage. And uh, some of you ask, uh, for a tour. I'll give you a little tour of the inside of the boat there as well. Very, very light winds today. <laughs> uh, and that's the forecast. The forecast is today and tomorrow, very, very light winds. So let's take a look inside. I'll just show you. Not much, not much to see. This is uh, obviously a very sophisticated <laughs> nav uh, station. For, for, I don't use a plotter. The only thing I use for a plotter is I have my Apple 
uh, iPad that has Navionics on it, and as a backup, I have a Samsung that has the same uh, same program on it. So I've got that's that's what I use for navigation, and for all of my other passages to Iceland and around the UK, I, it was the same thing. So I've never used a plotter, um, and of course I have an AIS uh, uh, always alarmed and uh, uh, that's running all the time. And then this is in. <laughs> There's not much to see. Up in the bow area, uh, those two big boxes that you see there are, um, uh, that, that's uh, dehydrated uh, food, uh, like 60 days worth. There's also that black thing up there. Believe it or not, that's a rudder. All, it probably weighs 35, 40 kilos. And, uh, but I just wanted to have a spare rudder with me. And uh, my little dinghy, inflatable dinghy that I can use and I'm going to put my uh, um, um, spinnaker up uh, up in the front there as soon as it dries out some more and then this is where I sleep when I'm at sea and for all of you who are new to this the best place on a boat to sleep is in the middle of the boat as low as you can get because the boat pitches like this the middle moves the least of anything and the lower so at sea, I sleep here or here, and this black thing is a lee cloth. So if I pull on the ropes up there, you can see that it pulls this up and locks me in there. Uh, and obviously below the bunk there is lots of spare parts and more food and water and uh, on both sides. So I'm, I'm, I've got probably 90 days worth of food on board here for what should take between 20 and 30 day uh, trip. And of course, there's the uh, kitchen area where I um, boil the water for my uh, to rehydrate the, my food in the sink. Although, in honest uh, honesty, I don't uh, I don't wash dishes there. I use salt water to uh, wash the dishes, and then I rinse them in salt water just to save the fresh water. Then back in here, this is where I sleep when I'm in port. It's a little more comfortable, a little more spacious. Uh, and this is what I'm doing right now, is what I, something I do every day, is uh, I'm recharging with my lithium battery here, I'm recharging the uh, appliances that I use, my Apple uh, iPad, the Iridium Go, and the Garmin InReach. And I've got a whole bunch of spare parts and nuts and bolts and uh, uh, shackles and everything you can imagine there and I, uh, the same thing on the other side of the boat. This orange bag here is quite important. If I ever have to abandon ship in a hurry, that's my grab bag. And in it I've got my wallet and money and passports and uh, um, a, a whole bunch of stuff that I would consider important to have. You know, I don't want to just end up on a, on a cargo ship going by uh, just with my clothes on. So if I have time, I grab the, uh, the I forgot, maybe I forgot to explain what that was. The big white thing up there is the uh, emergency life raft. So I just pull that out, throw it over the side there, tie it to the boat here. Then come back in and grab my grab bag and uh, anything else I have time for. Uh, and in that grab bag, I put in some, I put in, uh, I think a liter or two of water and some food and, th and stuff as well. So at least in the life raft, I'll be uh, comfortable for uh, at least a day or two. <clears throat> and then on this side here, it looks a bit of a mess, but this is where I have clothes and some more spare parts and tools and uh, uh, extra lines and uh, all kinds of halyards and things like that. So that is my home. So I thought I'd share something with you that's been uh, bothering me a bit for the last uh, 48 hours or so, it got me down a little bit, but uh, let me explain it to you. So, here's where I started on this leg, right up here. That's uh, Madeira. And then I came down south, and this is where we are now. And you can see there's a, this is my destination, planned destination, anyway, <laughs> Bermuda. It was an option to go over to the States. I, I don't know, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. And I've been watching the, the weather patterns very, very closely. Roscoe, what's, because what's key, key to this passage is the placement of the Bermuda Azores High, which is usually 
quite a bit more north from where I am now. And that ma it makes this, you can see, this all this wind here was 15 to 20 knots. Very favorable, just a zoom and I'm there. And uh, I studied, I studied the pilot charts, I studied the, play, the play movement of the uh, jet stream. Uh, I looked at how other people had done this. And I thought, okay, this is an unusual way to do this routing, but uh, certainly feasible. But look what's happened. Just incredible bad luck. So I'm advancing the timeline here. So this is Saturday. And there you can see very clearly the Bermuda uh, Azores High has dropped down 500 miles. There's no wind here. That's nothing. So I have two options. One, I can either go north, but you can see that means beating into 15 to 20 knots of wind and uh, with your own speed that makes 25 knots uh, and uh, two meter seas for about 1500 miles. Do you want to beat into, I mean, uh, the O-Star guys do this, but uh, I'm not all that eager about it. The other alternative was to go another 500 miles to the south and then come around this and uh, end up in Bermuda. So 500 miles and then 500 day you have to do back again. So this may well turn out to be the longest transatlantic passage since Christopher Columbus. But, uh, I could motor a bit. I have 100 liters of fuel, more or less, that could take me between four and 500 miles, but I'm not gonna do that. You know, I may use it just for a little bit to help me uh, boost the, the, the path. So that you can see sunrise and sunset. Quickly past the days. A fellow aviator who has also logged his final flight. Halashas. Or dead. Beating the drum very slowly today. And the, the mainsail was just flopping back and forth. So I rigged the, uh, the two foresails on uh, wing and wing. I don't have a pole. This is just a test to see if it worked. A little set up. Uh, the NKE Autopilot. NKE Autopilot has a good, uh, a good uh, setting for this. You just, I just set uh, uh, true wind at 180 degrees and it'll, it'll keep it there. It should keep the sails kind of like that. But you really need more than four knots of apparent wind for this to work, you know. I'm doing all of 2.7 knots. Ainsi soit-il. One thing I wanted to explain <laughs> Those of you, for those of you who are just starting now, one day or another, your fuel line will become blocked with uh, that uh, crud that grows in diesel tanks. And a diesel bug, they call it. Uh, and one day it'll get all stirred up in a gale and you'll have to change your fuel filter. And when you change your fuel filter, you have to prime the, uh, um, uh, prime, prime, prime the line with, uh, with new diesel. So you don't want to be dealing with a 20 liter uh, fuel tank uh, in a gale trying to pour that in, in, into a little bottle or something like that. So ahead of time, prepare a bottle, this is what I did, a bottle uh, it was one one or one and a half liters of diesel that I kept stored in that little bin that you see down there in in the storage bin. And yesterday, um, I was digging around down in there to get something out, and that little that bottle was in the way. And I just set it up, and I just set it on the deck there just for a second. And it was hard, hard the deck, boat was hardly moving, and I was digging around getting something else, and I pulled it out, and I turned to get the bottle of fuel, and it was gone. <laughs> uh, so I have to prepare myself another one and a half liter bottle of uh, fuel so that I'll be able, should need arise, to prime the fuel lines again uh, under bad conditions without having to wrestle with a uh, 20 liter uh, tank. Um, it's, hard, it's hard enough as it is. 
I have already had to do that in a gale once uh, uh, on, my, on my first trip to the Azores. I had to change the fuel filters in the storm. Uh, my good friend John Willis, uh, on his uh, his boat during the Jester Challenge, he had to do the same thing. So be prepared and have a small container of diesel fuel somewhere that you can handle very easily. Now these guys have really been working on their formation. Look at that. That's tucked in there nice and tight. It's called parade formation. Beautiful day outside, isn't it? Look. Until right there. That is a squall. That is they say in French. Uh, it doesn't look too, too, too bad. If they're dark black uh, and quite narrow, then it's going to be quite violent. I've got one reef in uh, that's left over from, uh, from the night. Um, I'll watch it closely, but I may stick in a second reef here. Well, that squall did hit. <laughs> You know, I was a little slow putting in the second reef. Uh, the uh, apparent wind went up to 29. 29 plus about 8 knots on the... Uh, 29 apparent and 8 knots on the... Uh, uh, <clears throat> speed over ground. So you can, the, with the squall, the wind went from... 20 to 35, uh, 37 knots, very quickly. And I'm sure that just in a few minutes, it'll be very calm here. The, the squall sucked the wind out in the energy uh, on the system. But it can catch your attention in a quick hurry there. So it's always a good idea to put that reef in. <laughs> I was sitting here reading a book instead of putting the second reef in. And suddenly we were uh, rounding up into the wind there at the 30 knots. So, pay attention. There we go. 30 knots of apparent wind, 9 knots of uh, speed over ground. But two reefs in. This is exactly 12 minutes after the squall. You can see 11 knots of apparent wind and 6 knots of uh, speed over ground. So now it's time to shake out those reefs because <laughs> there's nothing else coming, at least not for quite a while. A friend of uh, 30 years recently sent me an email and said, Patrick, why are you doing this sailing across the ocean solo, going up to the Arctic Circle and all this? You know, I don't have a good answer for that, but uh, every now and then I, I, I get a little bit nervous that the best of all the years have gone by. And I guess this is my way of challenging that. 